I'm going to tell you a story written by a man who signed his work, wrote many, many short stories. And he signed his work Saki, S-A-K-I. His real name was H.H. H. Monroe, and he was uh, from the United Kingdom. He was born in Burma and did most of his writing in England. It's called The Open Window. My aunt will be down in a minute, Mr. Nuttall said a very self-possessed young woman of 15. In the meantime, you must try to put up with me. Frampton Nuttall tried to say something that would duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt who was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much toward helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said, when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I will give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to him, whom he was giving one of the letters, was included in that nice category. Do you know many of the people around here, asked the niece when she judged that they had sufficient silent communion. Not a soul. My sister stayed here some four years ago, and she gave me letters to some of the people here. Then you know almost nothing about my aunt, only her name and address. Frampton was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. Something about the room suggested masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? You may wonder why we keep that French window wide open on an October afternoon. Does that window have anything to do with her tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to this very day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful, wet summer, you know and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without any warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back someday. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them. She thinks that they will all just walk in at that window as they used to. That is why the windows kept open every evening until it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? as he always did to tease her, because he, she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes, on still, quiet evenings like this, I get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. It was quite a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room in a whirl of apologies for being late. I hope Vera has been amusing you. She, she, she has been very interesting. I hope you don't mind the open window. 
My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds, the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton, it was all pure horror. He made a desperate attempt to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. But he was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention. Her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. The, the doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, an avoidance of anything in the nature of uh, physical exercise. Frampton labored under the widespread delusion that strangers are hungry for the smallest detail of one's ailments. On the matter of diet, they're not so much in agreement. Really, said Mrs. Sappleton, suppressing a yawn. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention. Here they are at last, just in time for tea. And don't they look as though they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned toward the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn toward the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them had a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they neared the house, and then a hoarse, young voice chanted out of the dusk, I say, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid an imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white coat. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall. He could talk only of his illness, and he dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel said the niece. He told me that he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and foaming just above him. Enough to make anyone lose his nerve. Romance at short notice was her specialty.